Katya will tell us about Rule 54 Reversible Serial Automaton, as is written there. Thank you, Katya. Go ahead. Okay, um, so I would like to thank the first to thank the organizers for organizing this nice event and for inviting me. And um, today I would like to to share some uh, of my enthusiasm about this really nice model where we can um, really get many uh, exact results. So the idea is that we really focus on. I mean, it's much less general than what people have been uh, talking about. So this really applies only to this model so far, but. Um, the nice thing about it is the fact that um, basically everything can be done exactly. Obviously, this everything should be understood. Um, sh should be understood. That the, well, I mean, it's not a, uh, literally everything, but uh, the point is that really many, many things can be done um, in in much greater detail than elsewhere. Okay, so it's about uh, it, the model was introduced at the beginning of the 90s, and then, as far as I can tell, not much was done until it became popular in recent years and I just put uh, there some re recent references. I think I put everything I could find. Um, if I forgot someone, I really apologize. Um, so, so yes, so the dynamics is defined on a one-dimensional lattice where every site can be either, um, uh, either free or occupied. Um, and so the name is defined in uh, Two time steps. In each time step, only half of the sites is um, only half of the sites sites change the, changes deterministically. So in the first time step, we take uh, this uh, so like uh, J and uh, we find new values of uh, the sites at the bottom. So the, of all those even sites, and we get this other other so. And then in the next uh, time step, we uh, do the same thing. Only now we're we are uh, evolving uh, odd sites. This one. So in two time steps, then we uh, it, everything repeats, repeats again. Um, these uh, discrete maps are given are uh, deterministic, so each configuration uh, of three sites uh, is um, equivalent. Uh, sorry, each configuration of uh, three sites uniquely determines the new value of the middle one. Um, so this is the formal rule, which can be graphically represented uh, as uh, these um, uh, diagrams at the bottom. So, for example, 0, 0, 0 maps into 0, 0, 0, 1 into 1, and so on. Okay, now this definition so far seems uh, a bit um, abstract and not uh, so concrete, but um, we can now try to take a configuration on, on the bottom and then just evolve it in time and see what happens. And as we can see, this uh, model describes dynamics of solitons that um, move with fixed velocities, either plus one or minus one. So you see this is a right mover, this is a left mover. Uh, whenever two solitons meet, they interact pairwise, as is here, and when they scatter, they get delayed for one side. So, for example, this soliton was supposed to be here, but uh, because of the scattering, it's delayed, and so it's one side back. Um, okay, now this, um, this solitonic, uh, so, solitonic interpretation of the model has many really concrete, um, uh, really concrete and uh, not so trivial, um, not so trivial consequences. So the first one is that uh, due to the soliton dynamics, we are able to um, explicitly express time evolution of all local observables. So um, in, in an efficient way, let's say. So the first thing we do is we map the problem of the time evolution of local observables. Uh, we can imagine these local observables to be just uh, density as some position. So this is our, this is the simplest observable, but it's actually enough because uh, it's a classical model, so everything is diagonal. Um, and so we map the problem of evolving this um, um, uh, this density in time onto a problem of uh, counting uh, solitons in a section of the lattice at length two t uh, of length two t plus one at time t. So the idea is that. Uh, we take a configuration of two t plus one uh, sites, and um, in this configuration, we just have to, uh, and then we have to determine whether um, at time zero, so at this point at the bottom, uh, um, the middle, the central site was uh, occupied or empty, so either z either uh, white or black. And um, the nice, uh, the nice concept. Uh, uh, the, the nice thing about this is that computational complexity of doing this kind of 
of doing uh, this kind of procedure uh, grows as t squared. So it grows polynomially instead of exponentially. So uh, why? Uh, so the idea is that uh, we have to identify all the solitons that are in here. And then uh, we can just look at how many times they scatter. So let's say that we start with this um, orange one here. Um, and uh, if you want to, if you want to, uh, to see uh, uh, if the soliton uh, came from zero or not, we just have to identify three solitons that scattered with it because we need three scattering to move it here, uh, like this. Uh, but at the same time, we have to to make sure that um, that uh, all the solitons that we're looking at are actually causally connected. So, for for example, this orange soliton scattered with this left mover here. Uh, but it couldn't have scattered with the green one. Okay, so um, the basic idea is really simple. Now there are a few technical details that one has to um, work out, but um, the bottom line is that due to this, um, uh, due to this final, uh, due to these two possible speeds of solitons, the only thing that uh, uh, the soliton can never overtake another one. So everything we need is uh, already included here and this can be done quite efficiently. And so what we do is we describe, we encode this procedure in an MPS. So we write a matrix product uh, state that um, the, uh, using this information uh, here as the input. Um, and now that we have this MPS, we can try to see if it gives us any, if it's in any way useful. And so what we can do is we can uh, look at correlation functions or uh, two-point correlation functions uh, at different uh, different uh, points and at different times. And so this is the density density correlation function. This is an exact result. So this is, uh, this is valid for any time t and any x. So it's just like just this binomial sum. Um, and if we plot it, we see that we get two uh, ballistically moving peaks, one going to the left with, with uh, velocity one half, one going to the right with velocity one half, and these two peaks spread diffusively. So it's uh, kind of a situation that Mark was describing uh, before. Okay, so um, this, uh, this is uh, quite, an, uh, quite a rem uh, uh, remarkable uh, property of, of the model. This, in general, can't really be done. Uh, but now let me show you another uh, consequence of this soliton dynamics. So uh, another thing that we can do is uh, we can efficiently express all multi-time correlation functions at the same position. So let's imagine that we start with an equilibrium state here at the bottom, and then we sit here in the middle of the chain and just uh, try to keep track of what configuration we see here, or only at one point. So we average over everything else. And so the idea is if we think of this um, in a generic model, what we would do, we would probably start with some uh, equilibrium state here, and then we would add, uh, we would try to evolve it in time while keeping the information only here. And if we think in terms of some, some kind of uh, TBD or DMRG, or, so if we try to think about this computationally, we would imagine at one point. So the question is if we can really reduce this uh, exponential complexity. And so it turns out that generically, no. Generically, this is, um, this still grows exponentially because the, uh, whether or not we're going to see a particle at the next time step depends uh, on the whole history of uh, on the whole observed history however in this specific uh, case of rule 54 we can do it and uh, we can write these uh, probability distributions in terms of an, again a matrix product state with a constant bond dimension so bond dimension three instead of growing with time growing exponentially with time okay so um the main uh, reason for why this is possible is the fact that uh, the equilibrium in these equilibrium states, all the solitons are uh, statistically um, statistically independent. This means that uh, that the probability of observing a soliton at the next time does not really depend on all this history from before. It only uh, depends on a few time steps. So uh, hence this uh, constant bond dimension. Um, now, one of the remarkable things about this is that um, if, we, uh, if we take, for example, an, an, the equilibrium state to be uh, a maximum entropy state, so the probability of any configuration is equally likely, 
the the configuration in time, so the probability distribution in time will not be infinite temperature, so will not be maximum entropy. So there are still some uh, short range correlations going on on all the time. So so uh, the maximum entropy state does not map into max maximum entropy state here. Okay, um, now. This then um, motivates us to try to think about this uh, time-space duality. So what happens when the roles of space and time are reversed? W what happens if we rotate the model and try to see how, how this evolves in, in uh, space? Um, now, the motivation is um, the, are these recent works on dual unitary circuits, which are the quantum many body models where this can be done and uh, rotating the circuits uh, gives you another unitary model. So in our case, what we would want to get is another deterministic model, uh, for example. Um, now, if we just look at the soliton picture, it seems that this could be done uh, since if we, if we look uh, at the, ti uh, the time dynamics here, what happens is uh, the soliton scatter and slow down while, while scattering. So this means that the space dynamics, if we can formulate it, would be uh, solitons moving with uh, fixed velocities again, but when they scatter, they uh, speed up instead of uh, slowing down. So for example, we can look at uh, the scattering of these two. So you see this, uh, this guy jumps over and goes here on this time. Okay, jumps over and goes here. Okay, now to uh, try to formulate this, let us look at the circuit representation of these dynamics. So um, we, we can encode our three-side rule into this um, deterministic uh, matrix, so this time, uh, time evolution matrix that acts on three sides. Uh, on on the, le the left side is left untouched, so delta function here. The right side, uh, on the right side, nothing happens, while the central side changes um, according to the, the whole configuration. Um, at the same time, so at the same time step, all these gates commute uh, with themselves, so we can just imagine to smash them together and we can then uh, write this really nicely symmetric uh, circuit here. So this is one gate, this is another gate, third gate, and so on. And so, uh, uh, so these gates are applied uh, first on even sides, then on odd sides, center to even, center to not. This now looks really symmetric. And now let's just see what happens if we rotate it. So we rotate it uh, just by definition. So we define this rotation uh, in a way that uh, we we get the same uh, the same diagram, the an equivalent diagram. Um, so again, uh, the top side and the bottom side are, are not changing, while the middle side changes. Uh, sorry, according to to this three, uh, the time deterministic rule that goes from these three sides uh, up here. And so this is the rotated picture. So far, we haven't done much, and this is really. Uh, general and so we, we haven't put in any knowledge about our system yet. So this is just done by definition. Now, at, at, uh, at the beginning, I was saying that we would like to get this U to be deterministic. However, uh, this uh, three-side gate is clearly not deterministic. So we can see that we have these two ones in the same uh, row and in the same column. And there are also these two rows and columns uh, with only zeros. Uh, however, it turns out that we can um, uh, we can introduce um, the notion of allowed and forbidden uh, subspaces. So we can project out all the forbidden configurations and then rewrite this uh, the whole space evolution as a deterministic evolution on a reduced subspace. So we introduce this projector P here. So this P is like a, di a diagonal eight by eight matrix that has uh, ones everywhere except uh, on this. Uh, on this entry and this entry here, where we have only zeros. And for this, it uh, clearly holds uh, you, uh, that u uh, p and equals p u. And so also it's invariant under it. Okay, um, now we can, and uh, now to see how this becomes deterministic, I will, uh, I will not show everything, just um, a, a bit of how to um, reformulate it. So uh, if we start with these three spatial uh, space evolution layers, uh, the first thing we do is we just uh, space, these, um, uh, space these gates slightly apart so that we see what is going on. Then we introduce these projectors. Um, we can do this by, by this um, identity I showed you on the previous slide, so this thing. You can just introduce these projectors. 
we move these projectors around because they're all diagonal. So we can move them around. And now we define this UE tilde or U odd tilde on the, on, for the other parity of sides. And um, my statement is that now this UE tilde is deterministic on this, uh, on this subspace uh, that is invariant under all these projectors. Uh, now this can be, uh, it can be shown, and I, I will not show it here, but it can be shown that um, or in this uh, subspace, uh, in this reduced subspace, uh, UE tilde and U odd tilde can be both expressed in terms of deterministic case, but they have uh, support seven. So instead of being three by three, they are, uh, sorry, instead of acting on three sides, they non-trivially act on seven sides. Um, okay. Uh, so um, now we know that uh, what we show I mean, if we, uh, what I mentioned so far uh, tells us that now we have a well-defined dynamical system also in the space direction. Uh, but now let us um, take a look at, um, at this time multi-time correlation functions again, uh, just, to, uh, ju just to see if uh, these uh, dual gates or these uh, space evolution gates can be useful uh, to really give us some, some um, non-trivial uh, results, some more, uh, more, more explicit results. Okay, so uh, let us look at this uh, multi-time correlation function that I was mentioning before with this, when we have this uh, uh, equilibrium state and we just look at solids in, this, in the medium. So um, by definition, this is defined as uh, starting with uh, an infinite temperature state at the bottom. So these gray sites are all one side uh, maximum entropy states where uh, one uh, and zero are both equally likely. And then we add a layer of time, of, uh, of um, one layer of time evolution. So one layer of, of the normal gates, uh, and then we add another, uh, and then we put one observable here, one here, and so on. So, um, so we add all these layers of time evolution, and we put our uh, observables in. So this is, by definition, the expectation where uh, so the uh, expectation value of observable one at uh, time one, observable two at time two, and so on. And these are all in these two sides in the in the middle. At the end, we have to uh, take an inner product with an, uh, again, infinite temperature states, uh, which is just due to the definition of uh, expectation value for, for these classical um, stochastic models. Well, uh, deterministic, but in general stochastic. Okay. Uh, so now we simplify this a bit. And the first thing that we do is we note that U is deterministic. So this means that uh, U has to map infinite temperature state into itself and also from the other side because it's, um, it's um, symmetric, uh, which gives us this light construction. So this means that I can just remove all, this lay, uh, all these gates here because, um, they, because of the first relation and the same thing goes at the top. And so then I do this layer by layer until I'm left it, uh, with this causal light construction here. So this uh, rec tilted rectangle. And now the only thing that I do is, uh, so this is the thing that was, so, uh, I rewrite this thing by just um, evaluating all these uh, inner products here, and what I get is this. Uh, and then I just, by definition, as before, I just rotate this diagram and use uh, dual gates here on, on the right. Uh, so to go from the left to the right, I just use the same definition as before. Okay. Now, at this point, I haven't used any property of the dual evolution. This is, again, general. So here we know we haven't used anything. Um, but we want to simplify the right-hand side of this uh, expression. Now, we can't just remove these uh, gates because they're not deterministic. However, they have non-trivial structure. And then uh, there are these two non-trivial relations that hold for them. And uh, this means that I can, just using the first relation, I can just remove uh, this gate here and this gate here because also the transpo transposed relations hold. So this, and then I can go on until I am left with only two layers. So uh, in, in this way, what I do is I can rewrite my multi-time correlation function into these uh, uh, two layers of gates and uh, align uh, and all these observables squeezed between them. And now, um, as I was saying before, uh, for infinite temperature state, we don't get uh, an infinite temperature state in time. So uh, we get really short range correlated state here. And uh, we can now check that uh, this is indeed the same thing as uh, 
uh, this really agrees with the other result that I mentioned, uh, and it's uh, really, uh, so it's, it's equivalent. Um, okay, so this was all done for the infinite temperature state because it's conceptually the simplest, but the same thing can be repeated for, uh, for a class of uh, equilibrium states, of, of Gibbs states, let's say, or uh, we could think of it in terms of like a sort of a grand canonical uh, states because we have uh, chemical potentials corresponding to left and right movers. Okay. Uh, so this was just like, uh, I was just trying to um, convince you that, um, th that uh, it's possible to introduce a more algebraic formulation uh, of all these quantities that we might uh, obtain in this model. And the nice thing about this is that it does not explicitly depend on the quasi-particle interpretation of dynamics. So in principle, it makes it more generalizable. So some open questions. Uh, uh, there are uh, obviously many open questions, but so the first one is how far can we push, uh, can we push this? Can we, uh, so may maybe the most urgent uh, question to answer here is if we can look at two point correlation functions, so the spatial temporal correlation functions, can we get a nicer or equivalent expression to the one that I uh, showed at the beginning? And uh, obviously we want to generalize these to other models. So, um, uh, a really good uh, candidate for a model for which this could be done is uh, the model that we just rec uh, very recently um, introduced in uh, this preprint. Uh, so other cellular automata could be uh, used. I mean, uh, this same, same thing could be repeated for other cellular automata. Uh, we could think about stochastic generalizations of the stuff and most uh, pro probably the nicest thing would be to find some quantum generalizations. And by this quantum generalizations, I, uh, oh, there are two things. Obviously, we can treat the same model as a quantum model, but uh, what we would like to do is get some models that really uh, treat, uh, that, that uh, don't treat uh, diagonal in, uh, of diagonal entries uh, of the density matrix uh, separately. So we really want to get something that doesn't have, like, a, that can't be treated as a classical system at all. And at this point, I would uh, like to finish and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Katia. Um, uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, what's uh, so special about uh, this particular rule? Um, oh, what is so special? I, I, we, we could look at the other rules, but the, the, main, the main point of this one is that we have these quasi-particles, uh, well-defined quasi-particles with fixed velocities and this scattering rule. So, I mean, the, for, obviously we could also look at um, the one that I mentioned uh, just, uh, just at the end. Uh, which has uh, similar structures, but uh, other than that, there is um, another one would be like a, a free dynamics, which is not what what uh, which is uh, in some ways a bit more trivial. Uh, well, not uh, I mean a, a bit simpler from the point of view of these uh, uh, multi-time correlation functions, for example. Uh, but then other rules, if we just scan them, look. Uh, doesn't, don't really have this nice quasi-particle structure. And um, so it, it's not clear if they are interesting or not, or if something uh, nice can be done or not. Thank you, thank you very much. So I, I, I had a similar question, but now let me ask a different one. I mean, people studied a lot this uh, box ball system, you know, which is sort of solitones of different sizes, which is also a discrete sort of dynamic. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you ever try to look at that? Um, yeah, I mean, a bit, uh, no, not seriously, but it seems to me that there, um, uh, well, I, I don't really have anything um, really concrete or um, to, to say about it. Uh, it it's, I think this other one is a, a bit, the, 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 the point is there that these, quasi, uh, these solitons have different speeds, so from, yeah. so it can't be directly generalized there. Yeah. So we, we would have to think about it some more. I mean, there is no direct um, link. Can I also ask? Yeah. Can I ask? Yeah. So I was wondering, uh, did you look at the transfer matrix in the 
uh, not the, the usual direction, the transverse direction, and maybe try to look for small values of time, uh, the structure of the eigenstate, maybe the, the leading eigenstate, because that would give you also essentially all the information you need for the quantum case, uh, kind of like what Bruno did for dual unitary circuits. Uh, I mean, the short uh, answer is no. Uh, I mean, it would be nice to, uh, to look at it, but um, uh, it, it's a fairly new result. And so we haven't really thought uh, about everything that could be done. I mean, that is, is, is especially in the case of, say, uh, infinite temperature correlation function, it's fairly natural to look at some folded picture and then look at the uh, leading against state. But yeah, so thanks. No, but okay, so if, uh, if the model is truly, uh, truly uh, dual unitary, what you would see, you would see um, an infinite temperature state also in the time direction. So, well, you, yeah, well, okay, but then, so maybe here some, something different happens. For example, the leading eigenstate may, might be a, a small uh, one dimension eigenstate. Sorry, mm -hmm. so as, um, MPS with a small one dimension. Um, since everything is so simple, I mean, it's not absurd to think that uh, maybe you have something, of, of course, it's going to be a quantum state uh, because the MPO is not deterministic, but I think it, it would be worth it to, 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 to try. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an interesting uh, thing to think of. I mean, I should think about it a, a bit more. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? So, Kat, I got a bit lost. Uh, how did you get like a propagator that was not a deterministic? Uh, I missed a bit the step there. Uh, so you're talking about this from here to here. Um, so this yes. equation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so basically, what happens is okay. So. The, um, Implicitly, if you look at uh, this diagram, for example, you can imagine this to be some sort of vertex model where you have um, these small balls that force all four sides to be the same. And these big balls that give them one, uh, uh, that um, give you one weight uh, depending on what is on the other four uh, lines. And so if you look at this ta uh, time evolution, what you do is you get, uh, you uh, you get this S1, S2, so you uh, just from the time evolution, you can imagine there to be nothing. And so there is just one line here, one line here, one line here, one line here. And uh, so the, the point is that what you do here, uh, that um, this weight of this one should be uh, Xi or should be this delta of S, S2 prime Xi of S1, S2, S3. So it, this just follows from the def definition of time evolution. But then this means that if you go to the to the other direction, wh what you do is um, you have the same weight, uh, but only now you put uh, delta function uh, these delta functions here and here. So it's it's the same as before. So uh, you s one, sorry, so s one is two s three s one is two s three s two prime is the same as u s two s one s two prime s three. Okay, I, I should probably include a, a figure. I don't think I can be much more clear about that. I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. Thanks. Um, and yeah, yeah, I have a quick question. You have a formula for correlation function. Sure. Did you try to compare with some kind of hydrodynamic projection formulas? Uh, not explicitly. I mean, I, I looked at some values of uh, diffusion constants. Yeah, but uh, I never did it really seriously to really compare it from the beginning. So um, I, I think uh, I don't really even remember how well it agreed or not, because then are always this, um, this um, uh, it depends how you scale time and so on. So. Yeah, because that could be nice because you have an explicit calculation here. Uh, sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, so if there's uh, well, a quick question, um, otherwise, then we thank Katia again.